Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Hello and welcome back to Just Branding. This is season four. I don't know how we're in season four already. How have we done that? I, wow. I do not know. But yes, it's Jacob Cass. It's Matt Davies. Uh, we are going to teach you how to become a brand consultant today. So this is a, we're not doing an interview this time. It's us, uh, just us this time, like season one. Uh, we are going to talk about Brand Consulting 101, how to become a brand consultant, some top tips. We'll share our background, you know, what skills you need to develop, what knowledge you need, our process, how to stay current in the industry, and much more. So we're going to see how much we can cover today. It's quite a bit, but welcome back, Matt. Welcome back to you too, and welcome to all our listeners. I think season four is going to be amazing. Um, so just so folks appreciate, don't worry, me and Jacob, we, we've, we've got a couple of sessions planned where we're talking, um, so we, we want to mix it up. We did some of this in season one, and actually some of those episodes were some of the, the, the most downloaded ones, which is a, uh, quite a shock to me. <laughs> but we are going to go back to interviews. We've got a, some amazing folks lined up for this season but for now we thought let's go back 101 back to basics let you listeners hear how we're getting on uh, in our careers and also share some of the tidbits and, and and methods and ideas for you as as you know we love to do um for you our, our loyal listeners so i want to say welcome to you listener thank you so much for tuning in and we hope we add some value to you not only in this episode but throughout season four thank you matt so let's start at the top brand consultant what is a brand consultant what do they do now, there's a lot of titles out there, so I'm interested to hear your opinion, Matt. Yeah, I think I think it's um, an interesting question. We like to kick off with definitions, don't we? So my definition of a consultant is somebody paid to improve a client's condition in some way, right? So that's quite a, a vague um, answer, right? Because obviously, you only get paid to improve uh, the conditions of, of somebody or of, of a customer. But what is a consultant, though? I would say it, there's a couple of um, a couple of things to perhaps add in here. Um, I think both you and I, Jacob, and a lot of our listeners um, who've come from a kind of a design or a marketing background, we're used to executing on stuff like creating visuals if you're in graphic design, creating logos, creating identities, creating assets. If you're in marketing, you're used to kind of pushing those out through various channels and managing social media and so on. And I would kind of call those things like execution, okay? And I think a lot of people um, are realizing, frankly, just being upfront, that execution is slowly becoming commoditized and has been for a number of years. At least I saw this, you know, some years ago and it got me- And now AIs are here. Is now scary. AI is here. I mean, wow. I mean, the 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 kind of the the growth of um of of the AI stuff is is scary, and the fact that you can put in you know a few a few a few prompts and suddenly boosh, you've got blog yep. posts and content written, and you know it's it's really it's really scary. But the one thing I think AI cannot do, and and you know commoditized execution cannot do, is that human element, right? That kind of personable advice, really getting to know a business, understanding um, perhaps a leader within that business, and then offering valuable um, value, valuable thoughts and advice. Um, so that's one thing it can't do. And the other thing I think um, AI cannot do is something that I always bang on about, which is alignment, which is the big thing that I talk about. So when we get a lot of people together in a business, the problem that they have is all kind of getting excited about one core thing and focusing and what they try and do is they all, you know, with the best of intent, go in lots of different directions. So you have to keep as a leader, bringing people back together and pushing them forward. Now, brand helps that happen. If you've got a strong brand strategy, if you know, you know, who you are here to serve, how to show up, what the big idea is, how you can kind of push everybody forward and align them uh, in that direction, then I think that's a really strong thing. So going back to the original question, I would say, um, you know, a brand consultant in effect is kind of like a business consultant, but rather than getting down into a very kind of a siloed area of the business, even such, such as marketing, I think the, the objective of the brand consultant is to try and keep that broad picture across all the different functions of a business. And really, at least in my, my, my experience, help the leadership team to forge forward with something really purposeful. So brand consultant helps businesses by leveraging their brands effectively, I would say. What are your thoughts? How, how would you you're sort on of- a, You're on a roll here, Matt. So I know, I try my best. <laughs> you, are, you are. So those titles, right? So brand consultant, how do you think that differs to 
you know, other titles like brand designer or strategist or like a marketing director? Oh, now this, this is a big one, right? Because with my definition, those labels could form part of the offering of a, of a brand consultant, right? So I know we're going to touch on our own sort of stories perhaps a little bit later. But for me, um, you know, you've got to execute on a strategy. You can't just have some rough ideas in terms of the business. The business can take those ideas and execute on its own. But a consultant might stick around and help the business actually get some of those things to market or get them out in the real world. The consultant might not be doing the execution, but the consultant might be advising and uh, kind of almost bringing in connections uh, and, and people from their network or wherever it might be to help that business solve the problems that are before it. So for me, the labels of, of a strategist, for example, I'd say, well, I'm a strategist, but I'm also a consultant, right? Why? why how, these are not conflicting terms. It's not like you have to sit in a little box mm -hmm. and just do the same thing. I'm glad you a said that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how I feel about it. And I think like a strategist is is somebody who isn't executing, who's trying to to map the the journey ahead into the unknown with obviously the consensus of, of the leadership team of the business and 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 pushing that brand forward. Always listening to the voice of the customer and how customers are kind of interacting with the business. Um, and the other kind of element to this, and I'll just throw this into the mix is um, a massive area that I think businesses struggle with is their culture. And brand, of course, links heavily into culture. So you can play in a lot of different areas as a consultant in brand because the brand basically is the glue that sticks all of that stuff together, or at least it should, and makes sense of it all. And it gets you the ability to sit at the top table to really help businesses not just create a veneer and a wallpaper and a look of look and feel but but also actually lean and live into that and i think that's the big challenge how do you how can you help brands actually execute and live into that brand and create those experiences that they claim that they should be uh, creating for customers so it's not just something they say it's actually something that's experienced Absolutely. I, I see it as, you know, the higher level thinking to simplify it. It's the understanding the problem, diagnosing the problem. And to do that, you have to really listen to those, the leaders to properly consult, to give them the right answers, right? What do, yes. what do they actually need to achieve their goals? So in a simplified version, that's how I see what, what a consultant does. And then you can pull in other people like strategists or designers or marketing directors, depending on what is required. Perfect answer. And I think you're right. So sometimes you might step into that role if that's in your wheel park, or other times, as you say, you might bring someone else in. And that's all part of adding adding value to, to the client and improving their situation. So I, yeah, I think you've actually got that, that spot on there. And I think the other thing to maybe mention at the outset um, is the beauty of playing in this space is that, and this is probably going to sound a bit bizarre, but you know, I'm going to say it anyway. You don't always have to have all the answers, I think, as a consultant. I think that's something that's worth putting out there. What you've got to have is um, the skill set, the, the energy, the personality, and the reputation to help a client improve their, improve their situation. You can have some various skill sets around that. But what you're really there to do is, as an outsider, come into the business from a looking at it from a brand perspective so from you know why why should somebody buy from this company you know what what what's where are they going where's the innovation here what's the big idea behind what they're trying to achieve what are the problems to your point jacob that this leadership team is struggling with and how can we how can we improve the situation now at the outset you might not know what the answers to that are you might not even know what all the problems are and i think that's the beauty of it i think one my background's in agency and running agencies and one of the problems I think agencies have, just in terms of the way that, that sometimes they, they set themselves up, is that they have this neat little process which goes from step one, two, three, and four. And at the end, you've got all these deliverables. And really, the client kind of comes to buy the deliverables. The client wants the website or the brochures or the look and feel. But as we all know, when you actually step into a project like that, the truth is, is stuff comes out of the woodwork, particularly when you start doing strategy, because suddenly you find some big challenge or a big hole in the customer experience or the reviews on Trustpilot are not actually, you know, reflective of the perception of what the, the company is actually thinking or whatever it might be. And maybe there's some competitor who's actually much more powerful in the in, in the marketplace than, than anyone imagined. Now, whatever the situation is, those things come along. And if you've already boxed yourself into a kind of a waterfall process where at the end you have to deliver on these number of things, otherwise it's considered a failure, 
what that means is everybody's focus is on the execution and that is unhealthy i think where the the, the consultant really leverages their power is that they don't have to sell execution what they sell is the thinking is the brain so i like to to borrow something from um the consultant's consultant who i, I actually was privileged enough to train with last year a guy called alan vice and if if you've heard us talk about this you'll know he's been on the show in last season and we've pushed his book million dollar consulting a few times but what i find is he says look a consultant is a brain not a pair of hands so if you're hired to be a pair of hands if you're hired to execute that's there's nothing wrong with that but but that isn't really what a consultant does the consultant is there to be the thinking and the brain uh to be able to give advice and ideas and inspiration and structure the strategy going forward not a pair of hands to actually execute now some people and I'd I'd like to ask you about this Jacob you, you know some people can bridge both and I did for a number of years and then as time went on I've kind of leveraged completely into the strategy space some people don't want to let go of obviously the the the, the creative element and that's that's there's nothing wrong with that um so it's just but it's about being aware of where you play and i would suggest the value that you bring because i think there's perhaps more value in becoming a, a brain than a pair of hands particularly when we see things like uh you know uh, ai coming along the scene what do you think jacob what's your sort of take on that that balance is tricky right when you're being paid to do the high level thinking but then you're also selling your deliverables that it's there's a tricky line there so finding your balance is definitely going to be key for that but there were some some things you're dancing around there about skills or knowledge that we need to have as you know a brand consultant i'd love to pick your brain on what you think you know makes a good brand consultant because for me it, it's like a wide depth of skills and a deep depth of skills in terms of knowing different areas right marketing design business strategy vision and bringing that together to help advise and just to come back to my point about selling deliverables you may not be able to do all of those elements right you may be you know a brand designer and you de- deliver logos and identities and so forth however you could also do the strategy part as well so you could it, yeah. it just really it really depends on you know what you're offering i guess is my point but the skills let me go back to that what do you think is you know makes a great brand consultant what skills and knowledge i think a number of a, num- a number of kind of things i think you're right it's not like it, and it it's it's not like you're kind of in a box right so you first of all you've got to be comfortable being slightly mm. uncomfortable right i think i think that there's a confidence that comes um in this space um because not every process not every method that you've ever used will always work in every single mm. business so there's always moving parts so you've got to be kind of comfortable in that space and i think as designers we kind of are right we're used to stepping into the unknown because a designer usually starts where they are today looks at a brief and thinks about the better future the better tomorrow and so is used to kind of thinking well you know how do we get there and that's the beauty of of design it's kind of about trying to solve the problems on route sometimes to 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 the end solution uh working you know testing and learning failing fast and all that stuff but you you're doing the same thing but um hopefully in a de-risk you know trying to de-risk yourself but doing it with, with alongside a business so that's mm. i kind of say i'm like a business designer well, i like i like what um, you said there it's like a few things like you said confidence but the unknown so it's like ha- having confidence in the unknown, right? Like yeah. trying to solve like solve the the puzzle, putting all those yeah. pieces Having together. Having the belief that you will get there with the with the client, I think is is very, very important. Um to kind of yeah, just being uh, yeah, being slightly uncomfortable. So that's that's kind of the first sort of that's a mindset thing, I think. I think the other the other thing that you need to um be good at is have g- great communication skills mm. um, and listening skills so they're, they're two different skills really i guess one is listening very carefully but then the ability to summarize like you said at the start jacob simplify the complexity which again as a as designers um a lot of designers are used to doing that you know used to taking complexity all the 50 messages that the marketing team want to put out there and working with them to slim that down into something super slick and powerful you know copywriters are used to doing that all the time mm. so you know these are transferable skills from many other places simplification listening simplifying and communicating they're, yes. they're big skills no, simplification I, I love that and that's probably why marty Newmeyer's books are so popular because he's literally you know cut down the fat and brought out books that are literally just what you need 
Uh, they're easy to digest. And that's because he's a, a master, right? And he can clearly communicate and simplify. Like anything that looks effortless, they're generally masters, right? Gymnasts or, you know, chefs, they, they just whack it out and, you know, they can do it perfectly. But that's because of all the years. So I think a, brand, a great brand consultant has that depth of skills so they can effortlessly simplify and uh, improve a client's um, situation based on their yeah. you know, goals. I think you're right. And you raised that kind of that, that thing of breadth and depth, right? Um, and I think that's that's true. I, th- I think it's probably worth saying, and I hope um, younger listeners don't take this the wrong way, but I don't think it's the sort of thing you can just like step out of university into very easily. The reason for that is you need to have seen the inside of a few businesses. You need to have gone through some sort of pro, you know, various processes under other people, learnt how to how these businesses tick, some of the language, some of those sorts of things. And so it isn't sort of um, uh, something that you can kind of easily attack without that, without putting yourself out there a little bit before and trying to learn along the way. At least that's how that's in my experience. Um, because you need to be able to, you're going toe to toe with business leaders, right? You're helping them, um, you know, with really big challenges, with massive, um, you know, risk potentially if you get it wrong. So there is, you, you've got to grow that. And I think if we, you know, we can give some tips out later, but one tip I'd sort of throw in there now is, you know, if you're interested in getting into this space and have no experience in it, then I think you need to start getting some some experience, right? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean jumping in and working with Coca Cola, right? Because that's never going to happen. But starting small, maybe starting with some uh, some charities, maybe you know small startup businesses, you know, just to kind of understand how these businesses tick and 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 how you know you can begin to add value. But as I say, even then, I think you probably want to have experienced, you know, so, having some sort of background in business coming at it from either a marketing, a design, a, you know, even digital marketing kind of perspective so that you have some something to fall back on, some understanding to fall back yeah, on. The, to the add principles, value. right? Principles. That's it. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Another skill. I was just going to throw in another skill, if that's okay. Um, and it kind of connects to the communication thing. One skill that I leverage massively is facilitation because I think um, one of the key requirements to do consultancy well is to knit together different parts different thoughts different people within an organization so as i say align around that greater future and if you can facilitate well in other words you can run workshops in kind of an agile fashion you can get people excited you can explain the principle of why we're doing this exercise why it's going to be helpful what you're looking for out of it um you can dance around personalities so that when you get conflicting views, you give people a good experience. They don't feel um, threatened, I think, is a very important thing, particularly when you're dealing with leaders. Facilitating all of that is a, is a crucial skill. And again, that's not something you can kind of just, you're just born with. You almost like have to fail and learn mm-hmm. and develop. And sometimes that, I mean, it's taken me some some years to get to um, the level I'm at. But, and, you know, it hasn't always been smooth sailing. You know, I've had epic workshop failures uh, in the past. But all of that, you know, you've got to have a mindset whereby I'm trying my best. Um, I'm going to be open and honest about it. And if I fail, right, that's OK. And I'm going to learn from that and, you know, review all the time what I'm doing so I can continually improve my service and the experience I give. And I think if you have that mindset, you you can, you know, you can really make waves as a consultant. What are your thoughts, yeah. Jacob, about facilitation? Yeah, absolutely. But I think, you, like you said, you you do have to have some background knowledge before you get into that situation, like yes. running a business, right? That's like the essentials of how how think, knowing how things work and how that uh, relates to brand and brand building. So facilitation is key, but I think that's part of the, uh, the skill set you will acquire once you get into uh, that role, if you will. So just to recap what we've said, you know, confidence in the unknown, right? Being uncomfortable, communication and listening is a really important skill and the mindset to get there as well. Uh, I think combine all those three and then you go into facilitating a workshop and, you know, listening, uh, to leaders and things that's really, I guess it's the cross section of all those skills coming together. And that's what I think is going to make a really great, uh, brand consultant. So, I think this is a good segue into 
our stories into how we became mm. brand consultants, brand strategists, brand designers, you know, and share that journey just to show you that it's not, it's not always a smooth path. You know, there's ups and downs, absolute, and maybe you can relate. And then we can talk about our process, how we stay current. And then we have some other more direct tips uh, to come. So great. Well, I'll tell you what, you go first. You go first, Jacob. I'd like to, I, I always like hearing Jacob's story. It's always, okay. it's always nice. And, 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 you know, it'd be nice to kind of get up to speed in the last few years because I haven't heard uh, the, I mean, we, we speak regularly, but it's nice to kind of get that, get that context. So yes. where does it start? Where does the story of Jacob Cass start? Well, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep it short because it's a, it's a lot, but we will, <laughs> so long time listeners will have heard this story before. However, I'll, I'll cut it, I'll, I'll I'll cut it shorter. So I started out as a design student, like most of us. Um, we, I studied visual communication and that was mm. for three years. Uh, and then I got headhunted by an agency in New York City. So I moved from Sydney to New York. So I went from being a design student to working for brands like Disney and Nike. And it was a huge catapult uh, for my career. I cut my teeth for five years in New York at different agencies in-house, um, and so in-house shops and also agencies. So I've seen everything from, you know, being a student to being a freelancer in-house uh, and also at agencies. That's really where I cut my teeth. Then I went, did the digital nomad thing for about three years. And throughout this time, I was running my own brand agency called Just Creative, which is still my brand agency today. And that's where I, I still work. Um, Just Creative has turned into a larger platform. Yes, it's my branding agency, but it's also a community. It's where we host this podcast. It's, it has like thousands of articles, uh, resources, downloads now. We have a team of 12 writers and editors from around the world. However, I also do brand consulting, um, you know, still. I also do brand design. I also do web design. So when we were talking about those boxes before, like I, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, I run, run a community and a mastermind. I do group coaching. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So there's a lot of things that uh, I do, but at the heart of it uh, is design and brand. So that's the, the purest way I could think about it is design. So I, I see myself as a designer, um, but also a, a brand lover. Um, so that's it in a very quick nutshell. Along yeah, the way, um, <laughs> I was learning a lot of different skills. Um, you know, just from blogging to design to business to the back end of um, business to marketing, design, email marketing. Like marketing is so huge, but it was d definitely digital marketing, SEO, uh, and just running a business, how to send the right message, how to position a brand. There's so many different elements that I've learned along that journey. And that's that's my story. So I'll, I'll, I'll pop it the thing over to I, you The thing I admire most about you, Jacob, is how diverse your approach is and how open you are to embracing change. Um, and, you know, some, I know you, you, you know, you have other little ventures off on the side, like you did the forest, uh, uh, you yeah. know, and very, very, various other things. And I think, uh, I think you are a great example of somebody who's really kind of gone wide. Mm -hmm. uh, but kept to the core of what you're about, which is great design. And in fact, that's how I knew of you. And listeners would have heard this story before. But hey, let's just share it again. Why not? Um, so, so when I, I going into my story, I um, I, I was born at a very early age, and then I uh, I I, uh, I went in. I, I did um, college, university here in the UK. Not 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 university, sorry, college in the UK. Got a diploma. Could have gone to university. Decided not to because I had a little job at an agency, and I was always keen to kind of get out there and. And, um, and get real work done. Um, went through a few agencies, cut a long story short, decided to start my own agency, which I ran for nearly nearly 10 years. I think it was about nine years and a bit. Um, I'll tell you about the end of that in a second. But one thing that um, just to sort of connect with Jacob was I used to run my agency and we used to, as anyone who's run a business and has done SEO will know, one of the things that you're really keen on doing is kind of looking at your keywords, your key, you know, your key search terms, and how your website is doing um, in relation to those terms in terms of the rankings. And um, I, uh, I, I remember going into meetings and 
um, this this just creative kept knocking us off of like top spot for key phrases like brand design. You never and all let this, this stuff. go, Matt, will you? <laughs> and I was like, who is this just creative? And I pull it up, and there's a stupid face of Jacob Cass sat there. <laughs> um, and uh, I was like, oh, I really can't stand this guy. J- Jacob knew absolutely nothing about this. My team thought it was hilarious because it kept happening um, as Jacob dominated the the, the, the search phrases uh, and and obviously outperformed us. So anyway, um, fast forward a number of years. Eventually, um, the agency had grown. We were uh, we ha- we got it to twelve people, which is quite a big size in in where I was in Nottingham in the UK at the time. Um, for th- for that area, it was pretty decent, and we had some big clients um, like Boots um, or Walgreens, if you're in the, U- the US, and Experian were a big one, and Nikon and spec savers which is a big kind of glasses um uh, spectacles uh company here in the uk so we were kind of punching quite above above our weight but one thing i found was um i found it very very hard to scale the agency model and i think there's a number of issues with that which i don't want to kind of bore listeners with but one one was selling time and trying to kind of package time in a way that clients would be really happy with Frankly, the clients didn't care about that. They wanted the solution to their problem. That's where they saw the value. And it was only on our side that I was trained to kind of think, well, that task would take X amount of hours. Let's box it in that kind of uh, way and charge an hourly rate and all that stuff. So I think there's a there's a number of issues there on selling time. And, and we can talk about that um, perhaps a little later, how to break out of that, because I think that's a huge um, a huge uh, you know problem with the industry and, and the way it's set up. Um, but the other thing was, was I found that people would buy me, but not necessarily my team. Mm. So that was really, really difficult. And you you actually see this in the industry a lot. A lot of agencies are built around individuals. The ones that have done it re- like kind of scaled and grown have been able to kind of take a methodology and implant that within their teams and then keep updating and reinventing that methodology. That is very hard to do. Very, very hard. You have to have very committed people and you have to have clients willing to pay the big money so that then you can bring on brilliant people so that you can then add that huge value and and scale, you know, do that at scale. That's actually quite tough to do. I found it very difficult, particularly um, in the location I was in, because back then it wasn't virtual, like you had to literally have an office and and that brings overheads and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I I, am... it sapped a lot of time. It sapped a lot of energy. And so anybody kind of going through, you know, basically jumping from project to project to project, trying to build sustainable growth, really, really hard, trying to get retainers in really tough. Um, and um, I just remember it, it became very stressful. My wife was also in the business and um, we just had some kids, which was great, uh, who I love very much. And we kind of realized that we'd created this beast of a business, which actually wasn't working for us. Um, and we were kind of, uh, I was running around trying to feed it and it wasn't feeding me, if that kind of mm. makes sense. So we made a decision to sell. We found a local um, agency, a lot bigger than us, digital marketing agency, actually, who were comfortable to to buy. They bought us. I joined their leadership team, cut a long story short. Um, I uh, I found the same thing happened again, but just on a bigger scale. So clients would fall, would, would kind of Fall in love is the wrong term. That sounds really dodgy, but they'd like they'd like connect with me. And if I was in mm. the room and I'd run a workshop or something and I'd help them break through a problem, they'd want to speak to me. So I was, you know, and you'd kind of collect cl- clients over time who would be very demanding and you'd feel like beholden to them and like all, almost like you couldn't say no to them if they were calling you at, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night. You kind of felt that you had to take the calls. So I was getting, I, I this happened to me over and over. I have a problem with this because I like to, I'm a people policer. I like to serve. Um, so in the end, I, I thought I'm, I was facing a bit of burnout, agency fatigue, if you like. Um, and so I kind of went on LinkedIn and flicked the switch to uh, open to opportunities. I think this was 2016. And um, so I was headhunted by a corporate I went in-house. I helped them build a, a kind of an in-house agency. We set that up. Um, and all the time, though, I was running workshops. Even within that situation, we rebranded. I was part of the team that rebranded that that company in the UK. I was flown over to, Ron- to Toronto, and I did some work in the US. So I, I, it was great fun. It was really good fun. I learned a lot. But then, as happens in, in corporate life, like there was a, a series of redundancies, and my name was on the list. And so I, um, I was... I was kind of offered a way out, which I took. And then I was like, 
what on earth do I do now? Like, I don't, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. So um, that's when I kind of um, was offered a couple of uh, consulting contracts. And I always used to think, man, to be a consultant, you need to be like 50, 60 years old, no disrespect to the 56 year olds, but you have to be, you know, quite long in the tooth. You have to have been around the block, probably got white hair. I don't know. That was my impression <laughs> of a consultant, right? Uh, but then I was thinking, well, actually, Matt, you have you have actually had quite a bit of experience. You've seen the inside of a lot of boardrooms, but I saw myself as a, very much as a designer. And when I'd sold my business, there was a clause in the contract that basically said I couldn't set up another design practice. So I was like, huh, what, a, what on earth do I do? So what I, decide, what, I, what I decided to do was set myself up solely as a strategist. That's a scary thought, right? Imagine, Jacob, I said to you, right? You've got to take all of your portfolio off of your website and just sell strategy. Now to a designer, that's like, whoa, like, because yeah. yeah, because that's, <laughs> that's how you see yourself, right? You've, ever since you were a kid, I'm a designer, I'm Matt the designer. But I kind of had some opportunities already. So it was kind of de-risked. And I went for it. And actually, do you know, what I found weirdly, uh, you know, in this space, I think the idea of a brand consultant at the time, was quite a new idea. Marty had written a couple of books, which I'd read, read and I absolutely loved. Um, but it wasn't really as, you know, it's become more popular as time's gone on. It was kind of, we, I was kind of one of the first into that blue ocean, if you like. Mm. And um, yeah, it went really, really well. And, and I found, you know, I was able to kind of build a brand in that space. As, you know, some of our listeners will know, if they follow me, you'll see, you know, some of the activity that I do. And I think that, that and for me, it's been amazingly successful. I've I've just kept it as a company of one. I went back to my wife and I said, love, I think I'm going to start a business. I'm going to just do strategy. She's like, no, remember the stress of when you ran a team? I was like, listen, I promise you, I will not employ another person. She said, okay, on that basis, I will allow you to start this uh, freelance. So I did. And, and that's been kind of a, a guiding principle uh, for me, just a personal thing. There's nothing wrong, of course, with employing people. If you want to do that, great for you. But just for me and my personal situation, um, yeah, that's that's how I'm, I'm set up. So consulting became the thing and is now my total focus as a strategist, as a consultant. And, and what I tend to do is exactly what you said, Jacob, is when a project comes along that needs some execution or needs some research that's outside of my skill set or needs some even other consultants who are maybe are experts in the category that you're playing in, you know, bring them in, become part of the team, the SWAT team that solves the problem uh, and admit when you when you when you're not sure. And I think clients really leverage that and respect that final point for me. I ask people often, like, why do you hire me? And um, often I'm told that it's for my energy. Now, how weird is that, right? Oh, and the beard, of course. Beard Beard and energy. But but, but it's kind of that's the the value that I think you can bring. So all I'd say to people is find your – I mean, by the way, some people would think, Matt, you couldn't stand your energy. I couldn't stand being in the room for three hours with you. But And I definitely couldn't sit at a desk opposite you. Uh, but some people value that. And they're the people that I, I I obviously want to work with, the people that need that in their organizations, that need that kind of boost um, to kind of move things forward. So that's kind of my story. I think I've pretty, I, I'm probably missed loads out, but hopefully that kind of explains how I got to be on the show with you, Jacob. Oh, that, that, actually, let me complete the loop. Okay. How did I get to be on the show? So when I went back out as a consultant, I was like looking at people I admired in the industry. And I, I remembered the uh, this just creative chap who would keep kept knocking me off. And so, um, and a number of other people that I actually reached out to, and I reached out to these people that I really thought were amazing and said, look, you know, you don't know me, but I know you. I've been following you for a number of years. I really kind of want to grow my network and connect with people again. I've been in-house for a bit, uh, working for a company. Da, da, da. Do you fancy a quick call? And Jacob, you were so kind to, to take my, my call. And then we had a couple of calls, and I think you were thinking about moving more into this space and also moving your community with you, kind of explaining it along the way. Um, And I had zero, because I'd been in-house, I'd not really built my my community at all. Um, I thought, hey, this is amazing. Jacob has got this amazing community. Um, I can maybe add some thinking to that and potentially grow my my reach as well. And so, and also learn from you, Jacob, and and, and hopefully vice versa. So it was a real kind of um, great match, I think. And um, yeah. hopefully here we are season four, four years on. I know, how, it's how crazy. On it really is crazy. So thank you so much for sharing that, Matt. And I, I love how it was like you set the ships a, um, a light 
right? When you yeah. had that ultimatum of like, well, I can't go back now. It's in my claws. I'm a strategist. You know, I'm a consultant. And, you know, you just went on that path and here we are. And you've, you've really grown in the past few years for sure. And it's been a, it's been a treasure to, very to watch actually. Um, I've been very blessed. I think, I think, I think that, that thing, it sounds like um, it's a nice story, isn't it? When you look back, but hind- and hindsight's a wonderful thing, but mm-hmm. It, a lot of it was accidental, right? <laughs> Being completely honest with people. Um, it was intentional in a way because there are a number of other sort of personal things. I wanted to spend more time with my family and consultancy adds a lot of flexibility if you set yourself up uh, in a certain way. Um, and as I say, one of the things I found was just breaking through of selling time. And I think that's probably a big a big theme maybe for another time if we want to get into it. But if you if you want to learn about that, look at Alan Weiss, and look at Blair Inns, who, mm, who's yep. written a book on that as well. Yeah, that's a great so, one. Um, I hope you guys, listeners, uh, you guys, listeners have got some value from listening to our story. It's just to show you that's never a smooth path, right? No it's way. just it, things will take you there and you'll get all these skills along the way and you use those unique skills that you have uh, to, to become, you know, something greater. And that's what I think is, you know, how you can become a consultant is just by using all your past experience, join it together, listening communicating, simplifying and facilitating, as you mentioned before, to you know create something brilliant for your for your clients. And the next point we, we're going to fly through some tips in terms of uh, for our listeners in terms of how to actually you know grow as consultant or be a better consultant. So gaining experience, right? Kind of what we've been talking about over time, you get experience. Uh, building up your portfolio or your brand, you know you can do this through you know uh, videos, uh, speaking events, you know, leadership, becoming a, a thought leader in a way to communicate your expertise, uh, networking, attending events and groups and, you know, LinkedIn and social media and so forth, degrees, courses, uh, certifications and masterminds. And we'll come back to the masterminds there. Following industry publications, so newsletters and LinkedIn and staying up to date with trends, right? AI, Web3, the metaverse, NF- NFTs, you know, brand in general, how can you use these to better your skill set? Some deeper skills, right? Psychology, human behavior, business strategy, and brand in general. Like these are some big skills that we didn't really touch on. Uh, And I would say practicing is probably the number one way to improve, right? Offering your services to whether it be friends or for free in the beginning to develop your skills, fake clients, and then building up your uh, experience through practice because it is a practice. And last but not least, but continuously learning and evolving, always attending conferences, workshops, networking, and, and just building up the skills from different people, learning from different people, right? So that's, that's what I want to share. They're just some very direct tips. Brilliant. And they're obviously, um, you know, we can dive into more of them, but is there anyone you want to explore further? Well, I, I think I think that's a really great summary. To be honest with you, I, I I'd written some notes down, but I think you covered off pretty much nearly all of, all of the ones that I was going to say. I think the the key is the, the main struggle I think people have when they first enter this space is how to attract clients, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's that's the number one sort of obstacle. How do I attract clients as a as a consultant, right? And the only way I'll tell you this now that you get clients in as a consultant in this space is if people already trust you before they reach out to you. I think I hope that's good English, right? In other words, that's, they don't buy, no one goes on Google and goes brand consultant. Oof. Oh, look, it's Matt. I've never heard of him before. I'm going to hire him, right? That is never how it works. This is a people by people game. So you have to be in the marketing game, I would say as a kind of a core kind of skill. So I think that's perhaps a good place for us to do a little bit of a deep dive. Um, And so to kick that kind of conversation off, I would sort of come down to bizarrely brand principles, right? You've got to brand yourself. Um, You've got to understand a couple of things. You need to understand, you know, um, the value that you bring. What is your value proposition? Um, You've got to understand who you serve powerfully. Like who's the best person for you? Um, Not everybody is right, okay? Don't make the foolish positioning claim that, you know, you're here for everybody. You're not. Who are the types of businesses, types of people within the businesses that you're here to serve? And then I think you need to work out how you how you become 
how how will they become aware of you? So Jacob, you mentioned public speaking, and I found that that's a massive. Well, at least when I started, was a huge um, place to play, which massively took me out of my comfort zone, and still does. But it's such a powerful place to to open up awareness about you um, in 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 ways that that that, that you would never even normally dream of. So even now. Um, I'm actually tuning in from Costa Rica at the moment where I'm kind of having a little workation. And even out here, I've, I've, I've been blessed enough to be invited to go and speak to a whole bunch of solicitors next week, right? Yeah. Now, I'm going to go and talk to solicitors about brand. This is massively, slightly scary for me because these are, you know, people talking about, you know, legal systems and offering, you know, a particular type of service. But even there, I think I can add some value. So I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to talk to them. I don't know if any business will come out, out of it. But what I know is it'll expose me to a whole new set of people. I'll keep curious. I'll keep humble. I'll give them hopefully some value. And who knows, um, at some point in the future, I might get a call from Costa Rica by somebody who sat in that, that talk, heard me speak and says, do you know what, Matt? I've got the problem that you addressed in that talk now, maybe a year or two later. And that's happened to me a few times where I've done some public speaking and it immediately, no, nothing, no traction. Give it a year, give it two years. You plant some seeds, mm. and you've got to. I was going to say, plant those seeds plant. as you, as you did. Those seeds, uh, they grow over time. It's not off straight sure. off the bat. You've got to have a bit of a strategy. And I, I sort of done a lot of stuff by accident. But let me just tell you real quick. So I do public speaking. Some might hear me. They then follow me. So you've got to generate content if you're going to position yourself effectively. You've got to continually talk about the problems that you solve. And my strategy you know, here's cards on the table. I always like to show myself in action. And so here's me doing a workshop, you know, literally terrible selfie of me doing a workshop. And this is what we addressed. And this is the problem we solved. Here's me doing a public talk. Here's me, you know, on a on a Zoom call doing some stuff. Here's me doing some research, whatever it might be. So the point is, is that um, you are constantly drip feeding and planting and watering those seeds as time goes on. So that by the time somebody then comes who has the problem that you solve, um, has that problem if that makes sense they immediately think of you your brand your personal brand or, or you know your consultancy brand oh i know a chap with a weird beard who seems like quite good fun he might be able to help us with this challenge and it's not a question well actually it's not even a question of he might be able to they know i can help them because mm -hmm. they've seen me in action and they've 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 kind of um followed me for for a while so that's kind of been my strategy it's hard work it's not quick um, and that's how I've done it. And, you know, that's completely transparency. Take that deal, you know, use it, do whatever you want with it. Please don't copy my bearded selfies, though. I would yeah, slightly upset. <laughs> well, it was 172 but, back you know. last year, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was actually. I literally went through and roughly added them all up in a, in a tally. And yeah, there were about 172, but there we are. <laughs> Matt's strategy on the table. <laughs> there it is. There it is, folks. Strip it apart, do what you want with it. And uh, what were your thoughts? You were going to caveat some of the stuff I was saying. So yeah, I was just going to, you said, you said it a bit after, but the strategy, right? There's so many different ways to market yourself Definitely. and so forth. So the you, you said people don't type in something and like buy off the bat, which it, it can I've happen. Not yeah. It so, could be, yeah. Like I, my whole business is based on search. So I okay. want to caveat this as well, but it's the trust and the brand aspect, right? So they can type in brand consultant, come to your site, and then they may browse your site. They see what you're about. You know, they go to your about page and they check out your socials and that's your brand and your uh, expertise and authority coming through. It should shine through when they come to your site. So that's a different strategy that I use and I have done since 2007. It's all search based, right? So do you find literally someone would Google brand consultant, let's say, hit your site and buy within that session? Or do you find that there's a, a bit of a, a process? So it's like a funnel, right? So they'll, brow they'll browse articles. Let's, let's just give a, an easy example. Let's say someone's researching logo design, for example, and they type in how much for a logo design. And we have a resource on logo design and they browse that and realize, oh, I don't need a logo design. I need strategy or I need bigger thinking here suddenly they start thinking bigger and they're like, oh, this guy's got some knowledge. I'm going to check out his about page. And he's like, oh, he's done a TEDx talk. He's been in Wall Street Journal. He's been on Entrepreneur and he's got all these credentials. He's like, okay, I'm starting to trust this guy. Let me check out his socials. Oh, cool. He's got a following. He's got some content there. He knows what he's doing. Oh, let me check out his portfolio. Oh, he does this too. So it's this system that is working together like 
that builds mm. up that trust that you mentioned. So the trust that you're building up is, you know, those showing you the work in action and being consistent with your, your message of like, this is what I do. This is who I do it for. And because you've been doing these workshops uh, and events, you've got this audience that are in, is in the background and then they, you know, when ready, they can find you. When, yes. The opposite is with when, when it comes to search, people are actively looking they're more hot leads right so they're warmed up a little bit they know they have a problem and they're looking for someone so it's a little bit different it's a quicker process so there's two to, two totally different strategies that we both go, use here that, yeah. and it really comes down to your expertise yeah I, I i love that thanks for sharing that and you know f- you know feel free to correct me uh you know if i if well, I it's not correction it's just well different. I, you know add add some extra add some jacob sauce to 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 to, to, to my to my waffle but the uh the, the thing you know so so what I'm oh, well, i don't think we're going to top that this year <laughs> what I guess I'm saying is, is no, you're right. And I think um, there aren't a number of tactics, marketing tactics. This is what we were saying about learning marketing, you know, and, and kind of understanding the funnel and, and so on. And I use a sort of a similar funnel in, 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 my, in, in you know, my website. You can go on there, you download stuff. I capture your details. I constantly message you. But I think, I guess both of these strategies, um, what they both have in common is that consistency, right? What is it that you need to be known for? What is it that you do that's unique to you that you can bottle and and sell? And how does that help the customer with their problem? Going right back full circle to the start of this conversation, you know, a consultant's job is to improve the client's condition in some way. You need to understand what that is. And then you need to kind of keep consistently hammering on about it if you're going to enter into the consultancy space. No, awesome. I think that's a good way to wrap up, Matt. So mm. thank you guys for listening and coming back for season four. Uh, like Matt mentioned, we have a, an amazing set of guest speakers lined up as well. And we'll be doing some of these, you know, one-on-one session or one-on-one, two, yeah. two of us. One-on-one, yep. two, both of us together. Yep. Ooh, that's great. Can I just say, Jacob, if anybody um, is listening in and they think, hey, do you know what? There was something interesting there. I'd love for you chaps to go deeper on that. You know, or there's a topic related to brand, related to consultancy, related to strategy that you are interested in, um, and you, you'd you'd love us to talk about it or get a guest on to help unpick that. Let us know. Drop your drop drop a comment um, in wherever you're listening to this. You know, Jacob and I are both very active on LinkedIn. We've got our own websites. Ping us messages. We're more than happy to to, to listen in. We want to kind of continue to add value in this space. We hope we do so. And, and as Jacob says, thank you for tuning in to, to season four and to this first episode. We look forward to more, more to come. So thank you.